Welcome to the McMaster University Demystifying Medicine Seminar Series. I'm Mark. And I'm Branson. We are continuing with our series based on Dr. Norman L. Jones' book called The Ins and Outs of Breathing. Today, we will be focusing on Chapter 7, The Control of Breathing, Part 2. By 1915, researchers knew how to measure the arterial pressure pressure of carbon dioxide, or PCO2 non-invasively, and had reason that mixed blood from all alveoli would represent the average or effective alveolar PCO2. So how do we take this information and make it relevant to situations such as when people have lung disorders or people who are exercising? The alveolar PCO2 is always changing and so it's more difficult to find an average. For two people with only a 12 mm of mercury arterial PCO2 difference, the total ventilation difference is not that significant. But when doing exercise, this difference increases. The lower the arterial CO2 pressure, the more the person has to breathe. Such differences are called individual responsiveness to CO2. So how do you measure your responsiveness to carbon dioxide? It was found that a small increase in carbon dioxide inspired causes a large increase in ventilation. This increase in ventilation results in a negative feedback loop that decreases the amount of carbon dioxide and it increases the amount of oxygen in the blood. But how do you measure the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood? In 1960, Morin Campbell performed an experiment which involved having his patients breathe in a rubber bag for a period of approximately two minutes. His theory was that, after a few minutes of his patients rebreathing their own air, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the bag will equilibrate with the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood flowing through into the lungs. As this process went on, the ventilation rate continued to increase as carbon dioxide was retained in the bag, and breathing did not reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. This allows for a linear relationship between ventilation and the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. Hence, the responsiveness to carbon dioxide can be expressed in terms of liters of ventilation for one millimeter of mercury increase in blood carbon dioxide concentration. Dr. Joseph Burrow, a clinical assistant, and Professor Edward Herring, the department head, both published a paper titled Self-Steering of Respiration Through the Vagus Nerve, which suggested a negative feedback control on breathing responses through nerve reflexes in the lung. Through multiple dog experiments, they showed that as the lung expanded during inspiration, the lung itself exerted an inhibitory effect from when expiration. The greater the increase in lung size was, the stronger this effect became. Vice versa was also true for expiration. They also found that nerve impulses originated in the lung and were abolished through secretions from the vagus nerve. Both Barrow and Herring suggested that the vagus nerve contained two separate sets of nerve fibers, one activated by lung inspiration, the other by lung expiration. Finally, when they blocked the trachea of a dog, it made a forceful inspiratory effort. This reflex is now ascribed to the activation of C fibers in the airways. Overall, these reflexes were named the herring burrow inflation and deflation reflexes, and places a great emphasis on the importance of the vagus nerve in mediating these responses. The vagus nerve carries messages to and from the medulla, so it takes part in autonomic nervous system functions by afferent and efferent signaling. Afferent nerve fibers go from the heart, major blood vessels, and lungs through the vagus. Efferent nerve fibers from the medulla travel in the vagus to the airways, heart, and stomach, and also affect the sympathetic nervous system, which mediates fight or flight responses. These responses include increasing or decreasing your heart rate, relaxing your airway muscles, and releasing the glucose in your liver for energy as necessary. These autonomic reflexes can explain physiological links between breathing and changes in other organs. Damage to the brainstem or certain congenital defects can affect CO2 responsiveness and ultimately affect central controls of breathing. There was one peculiar case of a female teenage patient presenting with an enlarged heart and signs such as turning a bluish color at night. Tests confirmed that she was retaining high amounts of CO2 in her blood. They also observed that she did not respond to increases in CO2, nor falls in oxygen in her blood. After these tests, physicians acknowledged that she was afflicted with what was known as Undine's curse, or more formally known as congenital central hyperventilation syndrome. This means that the patient does not maintain proper oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in her blood due to the lack of breathing. The prolonged increase in carbon dioxide levels causes the heart muscle to contract poorly, narrowing of lung blood vessels, and the retention of water in the kidneys. All of these changes result in a fatal condition for the patient. As we can see from this case, there are many complex interactions between the environment and the many systems of the body. However, one clear fact is the overriding importance of the control of blood gas levels, which plays a crucial role in all instances of breathing. 
Obstacles that make it difficult to breathe can result in severe distress. In order to experience this feeling for yourself, you can attempt to breathe through a drinking straw. Patients with asthma tend to become distraught, but they are able to sustain normal carbon dioxide levels within the blood. If there is a case where the carbon dioxide levels rise, the doctor will become apprehensive since this is an indication that the patient could possibly die. Ultimately, it can be concluded that the control of breathing requires maintaining alkalinity of body fluids, oxygenation of arterial blood, and removal of carbon dioxide. However, these three systems are not directly related, which makes the order of importance of the three factors controversial. Well, this wraps up our second presentation on the control of breathing. Thanks for listening.